good to see all of you here as uh, people are starting to trickle in. Uh, I'll lead us in prayer, and uh, we have a lot of people again out this week. We, it's amazing, really. Uh, there are EBC people scattered literally all over the world right now, from Europe to Costa Rica to where's, where's some of the Alaska, all over the place. So we'll pray for them as well. So let's begin our, our Sunday school hour today in the adult class by seeking the Lord's help in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, we are so thankful for another Lord's Day that you've given to us, how you've preserved us by your grace through this week. We do not want to take that for granted because we know that left to ourselves, we wouldn't make it even one hour. And we thank you that you have sustained our faith, that you have been faithful to us, and that you've given to us a day like this, the Lord's Day, in which we can pull away from all of the uh, things of this world, some of which are necessary and yet can be very distracting to us when it comes to the things of Christ. And we can lay them aside. We can fellowship with our brothers and sisters. We can sit under the teaching and ministry of your word and lift up our hearts in praise and adoration to you. You are a faithful God to us and we marvel at your goodness to us. We recognize that we're not worthy of even the least of these things, and yet you shower us with your blessings day by day. We ask that today, on this Lord's Day, that we would know your help, your presence. We come here to worship you. We come to our adult class that we might learn more about the great works of Christ, his power at work in church history, building his church and building his kingdom and we know that the gates of hell will not ultimately be able to prevail against it. And Father, help us, and, and we pray also for the Sunday school teachers and the children's classes that you will uh, give them much grace and help and that your word would be received into the hearts and minds of these children. And Lord, we pray for their souls that you will have mercy upon them and that you will save them and satisfy them early with your mercies that they might rejoice in you all their days. And it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, uh, folks, we are finally resuming something that was laid aside uh, because of the COVID. Uh, we were actually made it through February of 2020 on the study of the history of the church. And we made it through 52 lessons on the history of the church. And then COVID hit. We didn't have adult Sunday school for a while. And then I had other things that were kind of demanding my time in preparation for a module and different things that were upcoming. And then getting the confession classes that I need to teach for adult Sunday school. So basically, uh, we haven't been back to this subject for a long time. And a lot of you have asked me, when are we going to get back to church history? Well, this is the day that we're finally returning to the topic. And uh, now, it's been a long time, so... There needs to be a little bit of review, I think, this morning, because we don't want to just kind of, uh, you know, land in the middle of, uh, you know, hang everything on a skyhook somewhere and forget about how all of this is connected together. So let me just remind you of a few things. These are the major, major divisions of church history as we've divided them up. The apostolic church, the post-apostolic church, and then the post-apostolic church period, which we're still living in can be divided up into these four areas. The early church from 100 to 450 A.D., that's where we divided it. The medieval church, 450 to 1517 A.D. Anyone remember what was significant about 1517 A.D.? What happened? Yep, yeah, okay, good. You remember that, good. Luther's uh, theses he, he uh, posted on the door of Wittenberg Chapel that some view as in some ways the beginning of the Reformation, though there were other precursors that helped to lead to that as well. And this is the period that we're in, the Reformation period, and then we'll cross into the modern church period uh, fairly soon. Um, let me just remind you of where we are in the Reformation church period, because we've covered a lot of it already. We've already covered the Reformation in Germany in quite some detail, uh, and then the Reformation in German-speaking Switzerland has already been covered. Um, you think of... Um, uh, Zwingli and Heinrich Bullinger and those men. And then the Reformation in French-speaking Switzerland. We spent quite a bit of time on that, really focusing on the life and ministry of John Calvin. And then the Radical Reformation in Europe, we've already covered that, where we address some of the kind of radical fringe elements 
uh, that grew up uh, in Europe during the period of the Reformation as well. And then we, we, we address the Reformation in England, and uh, we've covered all the way up to the reign of Elizabeth and the Elizabethan settlement, and we, we broke off from there. We'll be returning to England pretty soon, but uh, the Act of Supremacy in 1558 uh, that uh, you, you have Henry, the beginning of the Reformation in, in um, King Henry in England, his son uh, Edward, who only lived for a very short time and then died, and then we had Mary, uh, Bloody Mary, and who tried to reestablish the Roman Catholic Church in England, and then she was followed by her sister Elizabeth. And we have the Act of Supremacy, which reestablished the Church of England, its independence from Rome, with Elizabeth as the supreme governor of the church. And <clears throat> that Elizabeth, Elizabethan settlement was kind of a mixed bag, you may remember, that uh, there were still elements of Roman Catholic tradition that were retained, though it did establish, really, uh, England firmly as a Protestant nation. And that's going to kind of be the, uh, the setting of the Puritan movement, the desire to, to thoroughly purify the church and to bring it in order with the Scriptures. But that will have to wait. <clears throat> until later. We then began to trans, the trans uh, uh, move into the Reformation in Scotland, and that's where we left off. So we're going to cover the Reformation in Scotland, then we'll come back to England, and we'll begin to pick up the Puritan movement as we transition into the modern period of church history. Uh, now, some of the things I'm going to talk about this morning are actually things that I talked about two years ago. I'm sure you'll remember all of them. Uh, and you'll think, well, you, we already know that, Pastor Smith. But I thought that rather than just jump into this, that I would kind of give a quick overview of uh, where we have been in the, in the Reformation of the Church of Scotland thus far. And that's what we're going to do uh, this morning, to remind you of a lot of those things kind of in a quick way and an overview kind of way. <clears throat> First of all, something about the setting of the Scottish Reformation. And we look at it from two, two angles, the spiritual context and also the political context. In terms of the spiritual context, uh, the Roman Catholic Church was very wealthy in Scotland and owned about half of the land in Scotland. And part of this, the nobility was therefore very attracted to the wealth, this wealth, and therefore many of the lesser sons of the nobility were actually appointed to influential positions in the church. And by that means, the nobility actually controlled much of the, the prosperity and property and wealth of the church. So the Scottish nobility and the Roman Catholic Church were kind of, uh, you know, wedded together. They were very intimately connected, which led to the church often being entangled in financial and political matters and very neglectful of spiritual responsibilities and of the needs of the common people. And also the church was in a very sad condition uh, spiritually and morally. That was something of the spiritual context. And then in terms of the political situation, like we saw a couple years ago in England, uh, the political situation had a great influence in the breaking in of the Reformation in Scotland. There was both a political side to it and there was a spiritual side to it. And at the heart of the political side was Scottish foreign policy, particularly Scotland's relationship with both England and France. England, at this period in history, was ordinarily allied with France's enemies, uh, the Habsburgs, who ruled Spain, the Netherlands, and the Holy Roman Empire on the continent. France was therefore kind of in a situation of, of being somewhat encircled on all sides and a bit isolated, so France looked to Scotland for help. You might say, well, why would the Scots, you know, uh, be associated with the French? Well, the Scots, on their part, were willing to ally themselves with the French against the English because they resented uh, the English claim to the Scottish throne. And so this diplomatic context is going to play a part in the Scottish Reformation. You may remember France is still remains Roman Catholic, while England broke away from the Roman Pope under the reign of Henry VIII. And so after considering this context, we looked at some of the early beginnings of the Reformation in Scotland. 
How did it get there? Well, Protestantism and Protestant thought and teaching first began to appear in Scotland in the 1520s. And it came primarily by means of merchants uh, trading between Scotland and the the Netherlands who would bring over with them Lutheran books and also copies of William Tyndale's English New Testament. And there were also Scottish scholars who studied in Germany and apparently also mercenary soldiers who were exposed to Reformation teaching on the continent. And as a result of all this, the Scottish ports uh, became hotbeds of religious debate and discussion. On July 1525, in response to this, the Scottish Parliament passed an act prohibiting uh, the import of Lutheran books. Now, the first great teacher and preacher of Protestant doctrine was a young Catholic priest. Does anyone remember that far back who that guy's name was? Anyone? Oh, it's on the board, isn't it? Okay. All right. Well, who was it? Patrick Hamilton, right. Now, there's a number of reasons why Hamilton is kind of known and had influence. One One of the main reasons is because of the family that he was out of. The Hamilton family was one of Scotland's most powerful aristocratic families. Well, Patrick Hamilton fell under the influence of first Erasmus and then Luther while he was at university, and then he actually spent time in Wittenberg, Uh, where Luther was still living and still laboring. And in February 1528, he was arrested for preaching Lutheran doctrine. He was tried for heresy before Archbishop James Beaton of St. Andrews, Scotland's highest ranking clergyman at that time. And he was convicted and he was condemned and was burned at the stake on February 29, 1528. He was only 24 years old. Now, Being connected to such an important, high-ranking aristocratic family, his uh, his martyrdom uh, created a lot of um, press, you might say, and was talked about all over over Scotland. And it raised interest in understanding why, what was it that he believed so strongly that he was willing to to be burned alive for it. And later, John Knox, speaking of it, said, quoting him, "Almost within the whole realm." There was none found who began not to inquire, wherefore was Master Patrick Hamilton burned? So it, it, it stirred up curiosity. And of course, that uh, is often what leads to people looking into things, right? And beginning to learn and beginning to understand some of the issues that were at stake. And Scottish Protestants began to appeal to the heroic example of Christ's martyr, Patrick Hamilton. He was martyred in 1528, and it, this was actually before England had separated from Rome. It was just a few years later in 1534 that Henry VIII broke with Rome, and this also had an immediate effect on Scotland when England did that. The young Scottish monarch at the time when England broke from the throne, his name, he, he comes down to us as James V, he was lobbied by Henry and the English to follow the English example and to also break away from Rome. While at the same time, the French king, Francis I, lobbied him to remain loyal to the papacy and to the French. Now, the French policy uh, was handled by David Beaton at the time, and he was the nephew of Archbishop James Beaton that I mentioned just a moment ago who condemned Patrick Hamilton and David Beaton was a very avid, avid or, or rabid <laughs> uh, Roman Catholic, and he arranged the marriage of James V uh, to Mary Guise in 1538. And she was the daughter of the Duke of Guise, one of France's mightiest nobles. And of course, that marriage strengthened Scotland's ties with France. Well, in that same year, this guy David Beaton, remember he's the nephew of Archbishop James Beaton, who had condemned Patrick Hamilton. Well, in this same year, 1538, uh, David Beaton was made cardinal. And in 1539, he replaced his uncle as Archbishop of St. Andrews, and he then becomes the dominant figure in James V's government. 
And there followed under his influence a, a flurry of persecution against Protestant sympathizers during the 30s and the early 40s. In fact, Beaton drew up a list of, of members of the nobility and gentry who were accused of being Protestant heretics. And it's reported, in fact, that there were uh, one, one figure that's given is that there were 360 names on that list. So that gives you an idea of what was beginning to happen in Scotland. 360 names uh, of nobility and gentry who were believed by Beaton to be friendly uh, to Protestantism. In 1541, the Scots government decreed that no one must question papal authority on the pain of death. And as James V increasingly came under the influence of the Roman, Romish clergy, and as the persecution of Protestants continued, many of the nobility, some of whom were Protestants, became more and more alienated from the king. In 1542, things became even worse. While Beaton was away in Europe seeking to organize an anti-English alliance, war broke out with England. The Scots and James were humiliated at the Battle of Solway Moss. The mishandled and misled Scottish army of 10,000 was defeated by an English force that was maybe around 2,000, about fifth the size. And James himself was so humiliated and so depressed after losing the battle that, that you'll read language of, the, of him almost willing himself to die. And indeed, he did pass away soon after that at the age of 30. Uh, but just before he died, his wife, Mary of Guise or Geese, bore him a daughter. He's going to be a key figure in all of this. She will be the future Mary Queen of Scots. You ever heard of Mary Queen? Of, now, this don't confuse her with uh, uh, the Mary in England uh, who followed Edward that's come down to us as Bloody Mary. This is a different Mary, but she's going to be uh, quite an opponent of the Reformation as well, Mary Queen of Scots. Well, after being defeated by the English in that, in that battle and during the first years of Mary's reign while she was just an infant, and obviously she's not able to intelligently reign over Scotland as an infant, and so the, the nobles, uh, so Cardinal Beaton's kind of trying to run things at this time, but the nobles managed to keep him from controlling the country on her behalf. And instead, at this time, uh, a pro-Reformation government came into power. And it was led by a, a man by the name of James Hamilton, not to be confused with Patrick Hamilton. He was the Earl of Aran, or Aran, A-R-R-A-N. At that time, Cardinal Beaton was arrested. Iran's government allowed the reading of the English Bible. And very soon, John Knox was to say that William Tyndale's English New Testament could be seen, quote, lying almost upon every gentleman's table. Hamilton also appointed two Protestant preachers as his chaplains. However, don't get too high on this guy, James Hamilton, he was more of a politician than anything else, and his Protestantism didn't last very long. Uh, he caved in under pressure and eventually allied himself with Beaton and the Queen Mother, Mary of Geis. So Beaton recovered his power, and the, papacy, uh, the policy reverted back to a pro-French, pro-Rome direction. So you see there's this back and forth that's going on. Well, it's at this point that I want to reintroduce you to the second of Scotland's great reformers. The first was Patrick Hamilton. Now I want to introduce or reintroduce you to some, you, someone you may have heard of, but if not, someone you do need to know about in church history, and his name was George Wishart. How many of you have ever heard of George Wishart? He ought to be famous, really. Someone needs to write a really good biography of George Wishart, uh, Pastor Kennecott. And, um, <clears throat> but uh, he was quite a man. He was kind of like, a, like the uh, precursor to George Whitfield in many ways, George Wishart. And uh, George Wishart lived from 1513 to 1546, and I'll just tell you a little bit about his life. He was a schoolmaster in a place called Montrose where he taught New Testament Greek. And of course, when you're teaching New Testament Greek and you're reading the New Testament, 
It's going to impact your theology, right? At one point, he was threatened with heresy proceedings, and so he fled to England. Sometime around 1543, he returned to Scotland uh, while Aaron's uh, government was still at that point pro-reform. And he was a fiery preacher. One of the things that's interesting with all of the, the, the political things going on and scholarship and so forth, in all of these movements, including in Germany, in, in Switzerland, in uh, uh, French-speaking and German-speaking Switzerland, and also in Scotland, what God really used to stir up the common people to embrace the Reformation was preaching. Good preachers preaching the Word of God. And this was the case here. Wishart was a fiery preacher of the gospel, and he began to preach throughout various parts of Scotland, and his preaching made a profound impression. At one point, he traveled to an area just outside Edinburgh, or Edinburgh, whichever you prefer to call it, uh, called East Lothian, uh, where he labored there for five weeks, and it was there that he was accompanied for the first time by a bodyguard. He had a bodyguard. Um, I hope the day doesn't come where we have to have a bodyguard standing up beside us when we're preaching, but he did have a bodyguard, and guess what his name was? It was a priest at the time by the name of, anyone want to venture a guess? John Knox, right, John Knox. Wishart's preaching and theology marked the beginning of a transition in the Scottish uh, Reformation, Protestantism, from its primarily Lutheran origins to a more Reformed perspective and concept of the Reformation. Wishart himself translated into English the Swiss Confession of 1536, which is a, uh, a wonderful Reformed confession of faith. However, sadly, in 1546, you remember how uh, Aaron, went, he kind of reverted back, Cardinal Beaton is back in control, and at that time in 1546, Wishart was arrested and tried for heresy. And an interesting little fact here, five hours before he was arrested, Wishart sensed that, uh, whatever you want to call it, he had a premonition or he sensed that trouble was coming. And so he dismissed his bodyguard, John Knox, and told him to, to leave, to get away. With these words, one is sufficient for a sacrifice. And therefore, John Knox was spared. And thank God that he was spared because John Knox is going to later be mightily used of God in bringing the Ref uh, full Reformation to Scotland. Well, after Wishart was arrested, the trial took place at St. San San Andrew's Cathedral uh, before an invited audience of nobility and clergy. Beaton made a great show of this. He intended this to be a great show trial to highlight the triumph of the old church over the new heresy. Uh, but things didn't exactly turn out the way Beaton wanted them to. During the trial, Wishart's bold responses, his constant appeals to Scripture to support his arguments and for his authority began to create a sympathetic response from the people in the crowd. And so when the time came for the verdict to be pronounced, Beaton dismissed everyone and cleared the room so they wouldn't be there when the verdict was actually pronounced. And Wishart was condemned. And he was burned at the stake on March the 1st, 1546. Quoting directly from Needham, The effect of his death was mixed. On the one hand, it meant the loss of the first Scottish Protestant leader who had the capacity to command a wide following. It would be another 10 years before John Knox stepped into this vacuum. On the other hand, Wishart's martyrdom burned itself into the minds and memories of Protestants and their sympathizers, stiffening their conviction that the old church was a corrupt tool of Satan, which had to be overthrown if Scotland was to enjoy spiritual freedom. And get an idea of how polarized the state of things in Scotland at this time had become. This is dramatically illustrated by something that happened a few weeks later after Wishart was martyred. Now, some of the Protestant sympathizers we might question some things they did. It were not always biblical in the way they responded to things. That's, this is something we can probably debate uh, later and probably when we're all sitting around, you know, drinking coffee, men and ladies, we can debate some of these things. But sometimes they engage in actions we might consider unwise and even unchristian. <clears throat> well, just a few weeks after Wishart's death, 
a group of lairds or Scottish lords formed a conspiracy to murder Cardinal Beaton. And in the early morning of May 29th, they broke into Cardinal Beaton's castle in St. Andrews. Uh, one of the party uh, calmly assured, terrified Beaton that they had nothing against him personally, but were instruments of God to bring justice upon him for murdering God's holy servant, George Wisher. He encouraged Beaton to repent, and then he ran him through with a sword and killed him. And the conspirators then took over the castle. And they were soon joined by other Protestants fleeing from persecution. And one of those refugees was John Knox. And the castle was put under a, a, a year-long siege during which Knox was actually set apart by the people to be their pastor and their preacher. And eventually the Protestants were bombarded into submission by a French fleet and were taken captives to France. And it was at this point that John Knox entered into the next period of his very interesting uh, life and career. He became a galley slave in the French Navy. And this is a good place, I think, to step back and at least begin to consider the life and ministry of John Knox. And we won't finish that uh, this morning. We'll be getting into that next time in some detail. But it's really quite amazing. You know, he's one of these guys that, you know, you read about his life and it just seems... Uh, almost impossible, the kind of life that he lived, the experiences that he had, the places he, he was at certain times in church history, at key points in the Reformation. But let's start with his early years. Um, <clears throat> we don't know for certain when Knox was born, but it seems to have been somewhere between 1513 and 1515. He was from a place called Haddington. His father was a farmer who apparently must have done well enough to be able to provide John with an education. He studied at St. Andrew's University and was ordained to the priesthood by the Bishop of Dunblane in 1536. Unable to find a parish, he worked as a lawyer for a time. Uh, we don't know for sure when he converted to Protestantism, but there are hints it may have been in 1543. Uh, Knox then, as we've seen, attached himself to George Wishart and became his bodyguard. And as we just saw, after the death of Wisher, he was there in St. Andrew's Castle when it was besieged and he was arrested. And then Knox spent the next 19 months as a French galley slave. And it was such a grueling experience that at times he was very ill and almost died while he was on, on the ship. And listen to this description of what life was like on a French galley. Usually propelled by 25 oars to a side, the galley would carry about 300 slaves who worked six to an oar, each chained to his bench. At night on shipboard, they slept either on the benches or on the floor. While during the day, since the galleys were only partially decked, they either roasted in the sun or shivered in the rain or cold. Now this period as a galley slave uh, certainly proved to be a great trial for him spiritually as well as physically and mentally. But even there, uh, said that Knox encouraged the Protestant prisoners by his courageous and character, his audacious character at times, something that he, he's going to become quite famous for. Uh, for example, once the French officers tried to force the Protestant galley slaves to worship in the Roman way and to kiss a painted image of the Virgin Mary. And at one point, they stuck the image into the hands of John Knox to kiss it. And he looked about, and then he calmly threw it overboard. <clears throat> and he said, let our lady now save herself. She is light enough. Let her learn to swim. <laughs> uh, there were no more attempts after that to impose Roman Catholic worship on the Protestant prisoners. Knox also emboldened his fellow captives because he was constantly predicting that God was going to liberate him uh, to preach again in Scotland. His predictions came true. After 19 months, he was released. This was sometime in 1549. However, he did not immediately renew his preaching in Scotland, which was his ultimate goal. But backing up a bit, while Knox had been a galley slave, things had become very chaotic in Scotland. England was pushing Scotland to agree to a marriage between the still very young 
Mary, Queen of Scots, and England's King Edward VI, who followed Henry VIII. Edward only lived for a short time. If I can recall, he was about 16, I think, when he died. And Edward, was, Edward of, of, of all those early rulers in the Reformation period in England, he, 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 there's, there's the most evidence that he was a true believer, a true believer who truly embraced the Reformation. And so there was this push for Mary to marry King Edward VI. And they actually tried, the English actually tried to force the issue <coughs> by invading Scotland once again in 1547. It appeared the English would succeed in controlling Scotland until Scotland asked the French for help. And this also resulted in the effort then to unite the throne of Scotland with the throne of France. Poor little five-year-old Mary, who's kind of torn in between. <laughs> Can you imagine a five-year-old and they're fighting wars over who you're going to marry? And uh, she was sent to France for safety so that she might be betrothed to Francis, the heir to the French throne. King Henry II, not to be confused with the King Henry VIII in England, but King Henry II of France boasted at this point that Scotland had now become a French province. However, there were many in Scotland who resented this. And in this way, a desire for Scottish independence and the Protestant Reformation were becoming increasingly united issues in the minds of many of the Scots. Well, with all of this uproar and chaos in Scotland, Knox did not return there immediately. Instead, he went to England. So now we have him in England. We transitioned from his early years to his years in England. This is during the reign of Edward VI, a very, uh, a very favorable reign for Protestants. And... Uh, <clears throat> so in England, Knox was free from persecution. He became pastor of the Anglican Church in Berwick. In 1551, he was moved to a larger uh, city, the city of Newcastle, as his influence as a min minister was beginning to grow. And in that same year, he was appointed chaplain to King Edward. He was also offered the bishopric of Rochester. He turned it down. We don't, I haven't been able to find why. There's no really known reason why he did that. But Knox began speaking out while he was in England against kneeling to receive communion, with the idea being it was like an act of worship in the Roman Catholic Church because they believe it actually becomes the body and blood of Christ uh, and kneeling before it as an act of worship. And this was still going on even in the Pro some of the Protestant churches as the Reformation was just beginning. And the Reformation in England was very slow. In fact, it never fully reformed the Anglican Church, as we're going to see. But he began to speak out against this, and he created enough stir about this to force Archbishop Cranmer to insert what has been called the Black Rubric into the 1552 prayer book of the Church of England, which explained that kneeling is not an act of worship towards the bread and wine. Well, again, you may remember that Edward, as I said earlier, he didn't live very long. He died in 1553, and he was succeeded by his Roman Catholic sister, whose name is Mary, right? Mary Tudor, bloody Mary. She's come down to us because she was a, a persecuting queen who, who uh, put to death many Protestant leaders. Well, when she became key, uh, queen, Knox fled to the continent, as did many other English Protestant refugees. He initially pastored the English congregation in Frankfurt, so now he's in Europe. And now while he was in Frankfurt, he became embroiled in a controversy over the use of the Book of Common Prayer. The majority in the church did not favor the use of it, nor did John Knox, but trouble followed when an, another group of English refugees from Strasbourg came to Frankfurt, led by a Dr. Richard Cox. He had been a tutor to Edward VI, and he had been Chancellor of Oxford, and he supported the use of the Book of Common Prayer, as did those who followed him. And so in the first service that they attended, they tried to force the use of the, of the prayer book. Well, in the afternoon service, so you had the morning service, now you got the afternoon service, Knox responded by preaching a message on the faults of the prayer book and its order of worship. And he also addressed the inadequate degree to which the church in England had been reformed. And so you're beginning to see sort of the, uh, the roots of what's called the Puritan movement, even in John Knox. 
uh, this desire to fully reform the Church of England according to the Scriptures. It's worship and in every way. Well, eventually Knox was forced to leave Frankfurt, and this brings us now thirdly to Knox's time in Geneva. Uh, he went to Geneva. Anybody remember anything important about Geneva? Well, Calvin's there, right? Calvin's in Geneva. And he ended up there as a co-pastor of the English congregation in Geneva. And he was there from 1556 to 1559. He, he looked at his time in Geneva as the happiest years of his life. And he pastored a congregation of about 186 members. And they were free to reform their congregation according to what they believed the scriptures taught and to practice reformed worship. Quoting from, quoting from another, the congregation declared itself to be, quote, truly reformed, unquote. As a number of historians have pointed out, it was indeed the first Puritan church. They believed that they must set up a completely structured body, both for their own benefit and also for the purpose of preparing for the time when they would return to England. It was because of this organization and pattern, planned and established in Geneva, that they wielded such an influence on the other exiles and upon the English church as a whole after 1558. And this church becomes something of a model for what the Puritan wing of the Reformation in England is going to strive for. And sadly, uh, that uh, fuller Reformation that the English, these Englishmen longed to see never really happened in England, but it will happen in Scotland, in part through the labors of John Knox some years later. So Knox loved his time in Geneva, having contact with Calvin and many of the other godly leaders in Geneva at that time and godly Christians who passed through Geneva and also learning from the order and practices of the church established by Calvin as he observed these things. He wanted to see the same things established in the church in Scotland. He was greatly impressed by what he saw. He once said this about Geneva, quote, I neither fear nor am ashamed to say that it is the most perfect school of Christ that ever was on earth since the days of the apostles. In other places I confess Christ to be truly preached, but manners and religion so sincerely reformed I have not yet seen in any other place. And so at this point in, in, in Knox's life, as we think about some of the practical implications and lessons, we learn something about the various ways in which God prepares men for their, their life's work. Uh, Knox accomplished many wonderful things up to this point, but in some ways all of that was preparation for what he was yet to do uh, when he goes to Scotland. And God was using all of these experiences in his life to prepare him for that work. And we also see how that preparation can sometimes involve very painful experiences. And we see examples of that in the Bible. Think about Moses. Before he led the children of Israel, uh, he, he was in the wilderness for 40 years. God was preparing him. And... Um, this is often the way things happen. And then we also see, I think, in this, we saw this when we were studying Calvin, the influence that a biblical, well-ordered church can have as a model uh, for other churches to observe and to follow. And that was the case with Geneva. And we've seen that even in our own generation uh, in Reformed churches in our own country in the last 40, 50 years, certain churches that God's raised up to be mightily used of him that have become models for other churches as they've struggled and wrestled with how to reform their churches according to Scripture. Well, pastoring in Geneva, Knox wrote a number of books, and the first was quite controversial. If you do remember anything from last time, you may remember this. Does anybody remember what the title of this book was? In 1558, it had a very interesting title. Uh, don't look at it. Huh? The first blast of the trumpet against the monstrous regiment of women. That was the first blast. I think, there was a, I, think I have the second blast in my study. The first blast of the trumpet against the monstrous regiment of women. And we're going to sell that as our book of the month. <laughs> <laughs> what was he talking about? By, by regiment, Knox meant government. And by monstrous, the idea is something that's unnatural. Okay? And it was a treatise against female rule that was aimed chiefly at Mary Tudor or Bloody Mary. 
Now, unfortunately, soon after the book was published, Mary died, and she was followed by a, a female Protestant queen, Elizabeth, who took the throne. Well, she didn't take too kindly to Knox's book, criticizing the idea of a female sovereign. The book even outraged the majority of Protestants who thought that some of its conclusions were a bit extreme, and there was this fear that civil war might break out against any land that was ruled by a queen if Knox's book gained a hearing. Indeed, Calvin feared that, and he had the sale of that book banned in Geneva. English Protestants were troubled by it because they were hopeful that the death of Mary and the ascension to the throne of the Protestant Elizabeth would be good for the reformation of the church. So they weren't very happy with Knox alienating the English or alienating Elizabeth. And Knox himself made this comment, My first blast hath blown from me all my friends in England. The next book that came out the same year by Knox was entitled The Appellation. We don't use that word very often, but you think of an appeal, an appellation. And in this work, Knox appealed to the Scottish nobility to enact Reformation. He appealed to the common people to put pressure on the government in favor of Protestantism. Now, we're about out of time, but I'll just mention this right now, kind of prepare us for as we lead into the next lesson. But most Protestants held to the position that Christians must refuse religious obedience to idolatrous governments. That's a non-controversial position. And peacefully suffer the consequences. But there were others in Scotland who were beginning to question this, including Knox's co-pastor in Geneva, the time Christopher Goodman. Knox, in his book, took the position that there is a time when Christians are justified in moving beyond passive resistance to an idolatrous government and to engage in righteous rebellion, to forcibly topple it. Now, many Protestants disagreed with Knox on this, though others didn't, and they will act upon it. For example, later in the 17th century, we see this position taken by at least one wing or, or, or section of the Scottish Covenanters and by many of the English Puritans during the English Civil War, it was actually similar, no, not, though not exactly the same, but it's, it's similar. It's akin to a position held by Calvin that a monarch's authority is not absolute, but that it must be held in check by the lesser magistrates. Now, there's a slight difference here. You know, it's not the idea that, that the common people should rise up in rebellion against their government. That's not what uh, what uh, Calvin advocated, but the idea that lesser magistrates have a responsibility to hold the higher magistrate feet to the fire, as it were, to obey the laws of the land and to obey God's law. And if the higher magistrate is, is imposing laws that are in violation of God's law, like abortion, for example, that the lesser magistrates have a responsibility uh, to address that. By every means short of violence, but if it comes down to it, even by force. And this has come down to us as the doctrine of the lesser magistrate. And uh, it's the lesser magistrate's duty to call a wicked ruler to account for his misdeeds and violations of the established laws of the land. And it works both ways. Also, that the higher magistrate has a responsibility to address the lesser magistrate who is violating the law of God as well. Now, that, that's going to be an interesting topic when we get into that. I think it will provoke a lot of discussion uh, among us as we uh, wrestle with those kinds of questions. But our time is up, and uh, we, we're back up to speed now in our study of church history. We have maybe a couple of questions, uh, minutes. Anybody have a question real quick? This may be two minutes is all we have. What's an idolatrous government? What do you mean by that? Well, you have to ask him what he meant by that, but I imagine he's saying what, what, what I, the idea that I'm conveying there is a, at that time would be a government that, that is uh, pro-Roman Catholic, a government that's controlled by Roman Catholicism, that's advocating and supporting an idolatrous form of religious practice or Christianity. And repressing other types yeah. of yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, because that would be, you know, you, have, you still have the sacral kind of perspective where the, the government and the church are wedded together. So 
you know, to rebel against the, the established church is to rebel against the government. You know, the two go together. Yeah. All right. Any other comments or questions? All right, let's pray. I think our time's up. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to learn about these things so that we might be better informed about, first of all, the work of your Holy Spirit through all the various means and providence by which Christ is establishing and building his church and his truth is prevailing over error. And also, Lord, we, we thank you that we can learn valuable lessons from church history, that we can learn uh, wisdom, that we would not be just uh, living in our own time without any connection or understanding of the times before us, but that as we understand church history, that we would understand what are good things to do, what are wrong things to do, and that we might be able to face uh, some of the same uh, challenges that come to bear upon your church in our own generation, though perhaps uh, slightly nuanced or dressed up in a different form. And so we pray that these studies of church history would equip us as your people in this way. And now we commit all these things to you and God.